We Defend the Italian Left by Honorato Damon. Every so often we need to check our own political assumptions in order to critically evaluate our conduct in relation to what is currently going on. We also need to examine the behavior of those who believe they are the repositories of who knows what coherence with principles and methods that should be common to us all. At first, our aim was limited to a non-formal adherence to Marxist ideology and its correct application without intending to carry out any rest restoration of this doctrine. However, we found we had, dis had to distinguish ourselves from those who translate the thought of Marx and Lenin into idealistic voluntarist terms, as well as, as, well as those who formulate it in terms of economism and mechanical determinism following the precepts of positivism rather than revolutionary dialectics. The Italian left has never endorsed the theoretical argument that says the party is everything and the proletarian mass is nothing, precisely because this is based on an erroneous and sterile premise. This premise makes the party not just the advance guard and guide, something that we all agree with, but also sees it as carrying out the revolutionary rupture and exercising the power of the dictatorship. In the first phase of implementing socialism. In other words, not with the proletariat, but for a proletariat, which is unable to carry out this task for itself. For comrades like that, the October Revolution is a kind of a bastard, anti-feudal socialist revolution. It is socialist only insofar as it is based on the armed proletariat and a socialist program. In short, they are talking about a revolution made only by the Bolshevik party and not by an expression of the Russian proletariat. But if we recognize the presence of the armed proletariat, it is, it is precisely because the proletariat alone gives social content to revolution and real substance to the work of its party. The fact that October is a socialist revolution is not just due to the Bolshevik party, it must be said clearly, but to the Russian proletariat as a historically revolutionary class under the leadership of Lenin's party. It is clear that wherever the proletariat exists, whatever the extent and power of its development as a class, there is also a historical framework, capitalism, even if it is only a capitalist oasis scattered in the ocean of a backward and primarily agricultural economy. In spite of all this, it is still capitalism, a capitalism that had already been the tragic protagonist of an imperialist policy in its first major conflict with the emerging Japanese capitalism, and had had its day of class terror when faced with the specter of proletarian revolution in 1905. The Bolshevik party had to take on an alliance of the Russian proletariat and the poor peasantry, which was possible then. It was a fortunate moment of a development that had of necessity to be Russian and international at the same time. As part of an international socialist revolution that had managed to break the chain of imperialism at its weakest link. There was a clear awareness that victory would not come about unless the Russian example was the first step in the international extension of the revolution. This would allow the development of socialist construction in Russia in line with a rising revolution in the major, more economically developed European countries, such as England, Germany, and France. The Italian left always based its fight on these principles, both within the party and the Third International. Therefore, these recent theoretical contortions on the question of the party and the revolution are for us merely the amateurish exhibitionism of schoolchildren. All this explains why, following the collapse of the Communist International, these comrades who held posts of responsibility in the party maintained that there was nothing further to be done for a whole historic period. So they retired to their tents, substituting the tasks of revolutionary militancy, even at a personal level, with a facile intellectual coherence and an easy sedentary adhesion to the principles of the class struggle, which, though continued without them, and against their very theories, first under fascism, then in the hybrid democracy which followed fascism. It is precisely at the time of reflux of workers' struggles in Italy that these comrades adopted this mentality. 
They theorized the tactic of pulling in the oars of the boat, the dissolution of the party, and a return to the tasks of the fraction, thus breaking up the one internationalist organiza organization that had proven itself in the fight against Stalinism, in whose interest? For us, the party is forged day by day through the slow and exhausting work of training cadres who cannot just be selected in periods of struggle or violent repression and disillusionment, especially when you are stabbed in the back by the betrayal of your own comrades. It is not and never has been historically true that the party only emerges in a time of revolutionary assault. On the contrary, it has to be militantly active throughout an entire previous historical period before it can reach its fullness as an organ of leadership and revolutionary action. In this regard, we must mention the ridiculous confusion that has befallen comrades when there have been spontaneous movements of the working masses, especially in the countries of the Soviet bloc. This confusion came to a head with the Hungarian events, which some, like the small group of exiles in France, have considered as a provocation of American capitalism. Others, however, have seen Russian armed inter intervention in defense of institutions and conquests that, while they were not communists, were in any case progressive from the capitalist point of view and therefore should be protected from Western capitalist attack. Finally, still others have seen in these events a national anti-Russian front, which supposedly includes the armed forces of the workers' councils. The relativism that differentiates between one reactionary and another, between Thiers and Stalin, between Stalin and Khrushchev, between a reaction carried out by a parasitic capitalism and that of a progressive capitalism, leads to the same result. Rather, this is an experience that must be sieved by a Marxist critique to delimit what are undoubtedly predominant positive class aspects and also point out the negatives. This separates us from those who seek to transfer to factory bodies which lack political tradition, a complete vision of the fundamental tasks of the class and especially organizational continuity in leadership tasks that belong to the party of the working class. It has to be said, and we have already said it many times, that the councils really are the highest organic expression of the workers' struggle and their revolutionary consciousness, despite the fact that, in the absence of the class party, they can only go as far as insurrection, but not on to socialist revolution. In short, we reject the conception of the party as an abstract entity that is not tied to the objective possibilities, that is not a living thing, nor tested in the changing reality of the struggle. In short, one that does not translate the objectives of the revolutionary struggle into the terms of working class life. Such a party would just be an easy way out, a cultural circle functioning like Thespis's cart, in which one lectures whilst others, in which one lectures whilst other comrades, reduced to the rank of mere cultural helots, nod in agreement. No, this concept of a party is not that of Lenin, who spent all his life among books, in struggle and exile, to prepare the human material without which the international proletariat might not have carried out those October days. If the Bolshevik Revolution is an undeniable historical fact, it is due to the fact that this party was tied to the working class, and the latter to this party as an inseparable whole, in a time that had become objectively favorable to the revolutionary solution, thanks to the collapse of one of the pillars of war and imperialism. Is it not here in these issues that we can see what differentiates Blankism and Leninism? Needless to say, our place, the position of our party, has always been and remains on Lenin's side. The Party In line with the historical tradition of the class party, we have considered the problems inherent in its existence, convinced that in raising them we do not immediately solve them, but only make a start in doing so. The main thing, therefore, is to address the central problem that has been and is the subject of our concerns, the existence of the party, or what is the same thing, its cadres, and how to adapt to tasks which change with the situation. Whatever its numerical importance, its capacity for influence and the reach of its activity amongst the working masses in the anti-capitalist struggle. The important thing is that we constantly confirm the precision of our ideas and our critique in events as they happen, 
monitoring closely the corruption that the class dialectic exercises on the body of those mass parties, which still claim to be socialist, and to help fight this corruption with a relentless and sharp Marxist critique. Above all, we also do this without tactical expedients or administrative solutions, i.e. without compromises, to bring towards the party those who prove to be ready to fight against capitalism and the parties that support it, starting from the premises formulated by Marx, Engels, and Lenin. In this sense, we do not share the mindset of those who will not get their hands dirty. We do not fear, we even seek dialogue with class elements who say they are interested in the problems of socialism and revolution, and who want to engage in the hard work of rebuilding the party of the working class. And we are not particularly irritated or, dis or disgusted by those comrades who, having put an end to a long, sometimes too long, Stalinist experience, have finally broken or intend to break with the party of Togliotti, provided they have a clear awareness of wanting to appropriate the ideology, tactics, and discipline of the party of Lenin. Basically, while in some ways the situation is different, today, today the same problems are again present. The same concerns about people and currents which emerged in the preparatory phase of the Imola meeting and the Congress of Livorno, out of which emerged the Communist Party of Italy. There is no doubt that at that time the abstentionist fraction of the Socialist Party, given the impressive theoretical nature of its platform and effectiveness, of its local groups at a national level was the organization that most actively opposed the political line of the party leadership and could now be considered in embryo as a party within the party. However, at the moment of the most acute crisis of the First World War, when the appeal of the experience of the first proletarian state which had emerged out of the October Revolution was strongest, Bordiga was fully aware that there was Though a specifically revolutionary party was needed, the chances of success of the abstentionist fraction to become a party of the working class were limited. Although the split had taken place at the Congress of Bologna in 1919, the abstentionist fraction as such could not objectively lead a party appropriate to the situation and the pressing tasks of the revolution. Given that the abstentionist fraction split had been possible at Bologna, not to have carried it out would have been a mistake of such proportions that would have forever compromised the theoretical orientation of the fraction, as well as its organization and the name of its biggest promoter. This was why Imola was a compromise meeting, a concrete anticipation of the Gramscian historic block of the left te tendencies in the Socialist Party. In short, a center where currents converged from diverse backgrounds, differing from each other on many issues, some critical. The abstentionist fraction was not really the focal point of convergence of these forces, even if it was its most important nucleus. The main focus was Lenin's ideas and the attraction of the October Revolution and the organizational needs of the Communist International. Moreover, this did not contradict the abstentionist fraction's thinking, but was in perfect harmony with its own decisions. In this connection, we should remember the third part of the motion that concluded the National Conference of the Fraction in Florence in 19, uh, May 1920, which mandated the Central Committee to convene immediately after the International Congress, the Congress establishing the Communist Party inviting all groups that fall within the field of the communist program to adhere both within and outside the Italian Socialist Party. But what happened was that soon after, at Amola and Livorno, this tactical policy was given a narrower theoretical organizational interpretation. These are the groups and currents which participated as equals in the Congress of Amola and formed the skeleton of the party at Livorno. One, the already mentioned abstentionist fraction, which deserves to be studied separately, given the positive factor it represented in, the, in this preparatory phase of the party, and also given the negative factor of its eclecticism when it came to formulating and implement, implementing its thesis on abstentionism on the terrain of political activity. In the pre-Livorno phase, which was not very different from the current period, the essential problem was the formation of the Revolutionary Party and not abstentionism, and it was not historically possible to form this party on a programmatic basis in which the ideology of abstention 
had a predominant role. Two, the group Lordine Nuovo, the New Order. Given its social and especially intellectual composition, this group already anticipated a trend which would emerge later, giving a key role to intellectuals rather than workers, both in the factories and in the broader arena of revolutionary action. Influenced by the neo-idealism that prevailed at the time in the world of bourgeois culture, this group tended to Marxism, but a Marxism riddled with an idealism that contradicted the traditional schemes of socialism and the socialist left itself. Indeed, while the left fraction thought that the revolution is subordinate to the existence of a party and tried to conquer its governing bodies to impart revolutionary will and leadership, continu continuing the traditional line of the class party, though the Orden Ordenovists thought less about the fundamental role of the party and focused their attention on the capitalist factory, regarding it as the necessary form of working class political organization, the territory of workers' opposition. For these comrades, unlike the party and the union, the council does not develop arithm arithm arithmetically, but morphologically, and tends in its most developed forms to promote the proletarian conquest of the productive and exchange apparatus created by capitalism for its own benefit. The need for these new powers, the organization of councils, to immediately flourish, irresistibly driving the great working masses, will cause a violent clash between the two classes in the course of which the proletarian dictatorship will prevail. If the foundations of the revolutionary process are not laid in the midst of proletarian life, the revolution will be reduced to a sterile voluntarist appeal. The differences between these two currents focused on this idea, party and councils. The party has its historical setting in the territorial structure and political administrative organs that capitalist development provides, while the councils embody the vital breath, the rhythm of progress of communist society. The highest form of consciousness of the proletariat condenses in the party. Its doctrine and the theory of class revolution, whilst in the councils, worker solidarity, is embedded even in the smallest details of industrial production. It is an organic whole, a homogeneous and compact system affirming its sovereignty, power, and historical freedom. We conclude, therefore, that these two currents, the most important in the Communist Party, had in common the perspective of the final outcome of revolutionary action. But they could not be further apart in terms of their original impulses, their methods, and even their understanding of Marxism. Some professed orthodoxy and integrity, others were leaning towards syndicalist conceptions of the Deleonist kind, which even today attract workerist trends. The circle of theoretical and tactical confusion of the groups that came together at the meeting of Imola was later expanded. If we take into account the minority currents in individual members, ranging from the Grazia dei Marabini formation through the electoral maximalism of many actual or aspiring deputies to young revolutionary combatants solidly anchored to revolutionary Marxism, but not in any particular school or tendency. We will have to come back to the experience of Amola when faced with the issue of rebuilding the party since parliamentary opportunism, the corruption of those who sought to do well for themselves and the fact that opposing class interests predominated within the party ended up draining the struggle of its strength and clouded its aims after corrupting its ideological heritage. The reasons for the limits, shortcomings and contradictions that accompanied the formation of the Communist Party of Italy can only be understood by basing them on this critique. Will these negative outcomes be avoided in the future? Our view is that, rather than the organizational, statutory provisions and the dissolution of groups as such, we should stress the dissolution of their ideology whenever they are alien to Marxism, to achieve unity not only in the purely formal organizational aspects, dissolution of groups, individual membership, candidatures, etc., but also regarding the unconditional and comprehensive adhesion to a theoretical practical platform from which emanates the conscious discipline that unites forces. 
gradually resolves the contradictions and ensures continuity of the revolutionary struggle. And so far, we have been consistent to this critical orientation, which has been able to mature among us thanks to the experience we passed through during the formation of the party at Livorno. Centralized party, yes. Centralism over the party, no. We should first address the issue of centralism, which the programists have never been able to define in an organic way. Linked as it is to the in interpretation of a given historical experience, it simply cannot be reduced to formal and scholastic abstractions. These muddle-headed left communists argue thus. In Lenin's International, there were no pure communist parties, so the use of the democratic mechanism was inextricably linked to what existed at that particular historical time. It is therefore obvious that an international unlike the third, which consists of pure communist parties, should be identified by a different internal mechanism and not by democratic centralism, which ceased to be operative with the death of Lenin. What happened after that in the Stalinist era is not covered in their analysis because it had nothing to do with the working class and the objectives of the revolution. But to suppose, as, as the programists do, an organization in a state of chemical purity, an international of pure communist parties as opposed to that of Lenin, made of impure parties, is playing with a metaphysical paradox. Instead of formulating the problems of a whole series of historical events through the lenses of dialectical materialism, they adopt a formal mechanistic calculation, which tends to get lost in the fog of the most obsolete idealism. We can tell these comrades in all certainty that there will be no international of pure communist parties, but only an international that will reflect within it the good and the evil, the contradictions and absurdity of a society divided into classes, themselves torn by various layers of interest, social conditions, culture, etc. The assumption of communist parties in a pure state with an equally pure world organization, even as a simple aspiration, is not the result of any serious investigation based on Marxism. It strangely resembles a certain mysticism which had its heyday in the 20 years of fascism. Lenin's international certainly had its weaknesses due to the immaturity of the historical period that followed the collapse of the Second International and the crisis then afflicting the capitalist world. Every proletarian organization reproduces, though in a more advanced way, and on an inversely proportional scale, the characteristics of the historical period in which it was formed, and it is certain that the negative aspects present in the Third International will be present, although differently articulated in future international organizations, as amply proved by the objective conditions in which the various left communist groupings, who today claim the right to make a contribution to the reconstruction of the International Proletarian Party, are operating. Amongst these groups, the one that suffers most from intolerance and crises is the Bordigas Communist Program, where the dynamics of democratic centralism work more deeply, as seen in the explosive cycle of its internal contradictions. Today, for polemical convenience, the programists would like to pass off the Third International as made up of impure parties. But here's how Bordiga previously judged Lenin's International, in clear contradiction with the current positions. After restoring proletarian theory, the practical work of the Third International towered over the divisions raised by opportunists of all countries in banning from the ranks of the world's vanguard all reformists, social democrats, and centrists of all types. This renewal took place in all the old parties and is the foundation of the new revolutionary party of the proletariat. Lenin guided with an iron hand the difficult task of dispelling all confusions and weaknesses. The real strength of these Bordigists lies in their inconsistency. How can this group, with its structure of an aristocratic and intellectual elite with a filtered and distilled Marxism, developed in back rooms rather than in the storm of class struggle, contest the accuracy of what we are saying? So then, how can we resolve, with Leninist integrity, the debate over the two faces of centralism. In the phase of imperialist domination and proletarian revolution, no organization of the revolutionary party can conceivably exist 
which is not based on a highly centralized structure. Perhaps this is the feature that most dramatically distinguishes it from parliamentary parties. If centralism is therefore an imperative requirement imposed by class conflict, the attributes of democratic and organic define the subjective terms of a polemical distinction that has never affected the substance of this centralization. Who can say with absolute precision how far bodies involved in this centralization make use of the tools of democracy, active participation and active control of the rank and file, and how far the centers of power are based on an authoritarian regime in the physical person of a leader and through him to the central committee? For the Bordigists of Programma, the problem is posed in terms that come from the counter-revolutionary practice of Stalinism. This is how they tried, finally, to clarify their extraordinary theory that goes under the name of organic centralism. We have reproduced it above in the same words in which it was formulated. But we need to clarify once and for all the relationship that, is, that has to exist between the center and the base so that the party is structured and operates according to Leninist principles. An ongoing dialectical relationship exists between the members and the party center. It is obviously on the basis of that relationship in the context of theoretical and political platform already agreed that the party leadership develops its tactical action. Lenin never advocated, either in theory or in his political actions, any other way in which the organization could act. And how can we understand the organizational formula of a central committee or of a leader who relies only on himself? on his capacity as related to a set of already planned possible moves in relation to no less foreseen outcomes, whilst the so-called membership can usefully be, for, be ordered to perform actions indicated by the leadership. It simply means the same as the policy of the Central Committee under Stalin, once all working class elements had been eliminated from the dictatorship of the proletariat. It means a deep and irreparable rupture between the members of the party and its directing center and the resulting slide into the open reconstruction of capitalism. It means a deep, <clears throat> sorry. It also means that the Central Committee of the Russian Communist Party and Stalin himself was tied to a set of possible moves that were perfectly planned in advance that would be carried out with equal accuracy in terms and in a, in a reality we all know. What we are denouncing are the disastrous consequences which occur in a supposedly revolutionary party when its central organ, as a body, operates outside of the bounds and control of the organization's membership. But closer to our experience, we have to denounce precisely those who postulate, or allow to be postulated, this laughable distinction between a political membership required only to carry out acts indicated by the center, and a center that is entrusted with such powers of foresight and divination that it does not offer us a very encouraging sight. And here we are dealing with comrades who in terms of preparation and long militancy are highly skilled and command the respect and confidence of the whole party. Was the leadership of the Communist Party of Italy, through Bordiga's declarations to the common turn, perhaps not bound to a set of possible options that denied the possibility of fascism's rise to power at the very time when it was carrying out the march on Rome? And was this glaring error of perspective not in correspondence with the no less foreseeable outcome of jeopardizing the party with the tactics, tactic of the offensive for the offensive's sake? And who prepared a scientific analysis of the Russian economy defining the October Revolution as anti-feudal revolution, after having celebrated it as a socialist? Had Bordiga not affirmed in Lenin on the path of revolution, the revolution will be made in Russia by and for the working class itself. And further, Soviet power was victorious. The dictatorship of the proletariat predicted by Marx made its tremendous entrance onto the stage of history. How should we judge someone who was the most prominent exponent of the party and of left-wing communism, who refused to become a militant in the internationalist communist party at the time of its formation, as he considered it a mistake to fight directly against the National Communist Party, the PCI, with the excuse that the workers were in the party of Togliotti? Then when our split occurred, agreed to enter the PCDI 
provided that the rump remained true to him, politically neutered and reduced to a sect of parrots of not always digested formulae. What was his contribution to the development of a critical examination of the nature of the Second World War and the role played by Russia as a major imperialist player when he rejected our definition of state capitalism to speculate about Russia as a spurious form of industrial state? There are many more questions, but we have said enough to show how ill-founded, precarious, and objectively dangerous is his claim to assign to the Central Committee, and this or that person, whatever their esteem or skills of divination, the tasks of arbitrarily developing our theory, and functions of leadership outside of and above the party as a whole. Lenin, at his most personal and most decisive, by which we mean the Lenin of the April Theses, had a desperate determination to go to the sailors, beyond the formal organization of the Bolshevik Party's Central Committee, whose positions will, which were based on misunderstanding and compromise. Lenin was not operating on organic or even democratic centralism here, but acting as the chief pillar of the coming revolution, the only one who had understood and endorsed the demands of the working class. And this is because his feet were firmly on a class terrain, because he thought and worked in class terms and for the class and had a very lively sense of history, which teaches us that revolution loves action and hates cowards who turn up a day late. In this constant dialectical relationship between the membership and leadership of the party, in this necessary integration of freedom and authority, lies the solution of a problem to which professional objectors have perhaps paid too much attention. Any revolutionary party which is not a mere abstraction has to address the problems of the class struggle in a historical climate in which violence and unchallenged authority dominates. In order to increasingly become a living instrument of combat, it can only be organized around the most iron unity. Its ranks, therefore, have to be closed against the general thrust of the counter-revolution. The Revolutionary Party does not ape bourgeois parties, but obeys the need to adapt its organizational structure to the objective condition of the revolutionary struggle. The elementary tactical principle of the Revolutionary Party in action is that it must take into account the characteristics of the terrain on which it works, and that its members are adequately prepared for their tasks. We do not believe there needs to be disagreements on the question of centralism. These only begin when we talk in democratic or organic terms. The use, or worse, the abuse of the term organic can lead to forms of authoritarian degeneration which break the dialectical relationship that must exist between the leadership and its members, or and the members. The experience of Lenin is still valid, and it is vital to be able to fuse together in a single vision the seeming contradiction between democratic and organic centralism. Circles and the Revolutionary Party After clarifying the party's traditional thinking concerning the problem of centralism, a problem that sophists, pedants, and obscurantists place at the center of a debate that is neither head nor tail, which reduces the question to a futile barroom debate about whether centralism should be democratic or organic. We think that centralism, understood and practiced by Lenin, is the best way to run a revolutionary party called upon to solve the wondrous task of organization in handling the most irrational and violent events full of inexorable, unknown, unforeseen factors namely the revolutionary conquest of capitalist power, which is the most skilled and ruthless organizer of violence, whether police or military that history has ever known. But a revolutionary party, which for the most part should only be made up of worker cadres selected in the class struggle, can only be a powerful instrument of revolutionary action to the extent that its iron unity resolves the problem of permanent interdependence between the top and the bottom of the organization. Namely, to the extent that the constant relationship between freedom and discipline lives and acts in the collective consciousness of the party. And we come to another aspect of the debate that Programma started in such a clumsy and thoughtless manner, that of the circles, in which today the chaotic and scattered anti-Stalinist left seems to be enclosed and almost lost. 
We use the adjective anti-Stalinist and not revolutionary because obviously not all anti-Stalinists are revolutionary, but only in certain cases. To what and whom do these circles refer? What are they really? What are the analogies with the historical phase in which circles were developed? With the period of the old Iskra? Are there now objective conditions in place that allow these circles, assuming that they exist, to be a factor in the reconstruction of the Revolutionary Party, even if not a determinant factor? It is always a pleasure for its freshness and because there is always something new there to look back to the events that preceded the Second Congress in the years of preparation. The work of ideological, political, and organizational delimitation of the different organizations which later went to make up the party had to be carried out then, following the plan drawn up by the old Iskra. Lenin also thought it was the party's historical tendency that made, keep in mind that this happened two or three years before 1905, the year of the first revolution, the convergence of numerous groups so important, which although they did not have a common platform, did at least have a minimal agreement that could be used as an indispensable bond. This is how Lenin concretized the essential task of the Congress. To create a true party founded on the ide ideological and organizational principles formulated and developed by Iskra, the three years of Iskra's activity and the fact of having been recognized by most of the committees obliges the Congress to work in that direction. Iskra's program and tendency should become the program and the tendency of the party. Iskra's plans on organizational issues should be sanctioned in the party's organizational statutes. But it is clear that this will have to be fought for. The representation for Congress ensured the presence of organizations that had fought resolutely against Iskra, and others who, while recognizing Iskra as the governing body, actually pursued their own plans and were distinguished by their instability in the realm of principles. Under these conditions, Congress could only become the arena for the victory of the Iskra trend. And when addressing the challenge, of unifying forces that were not homogeneous following the plans of Iskra, Lenin knew he had to have the support of external groups as well as those representing Iskra itself, as the Second Congress was to make clear. The debate, or rather the altercation between all these tendencies arose over certain articles of the statutes, and not by chance and this certainly did not happen because they posed a different way of solving apparently formal, purely organizational problems, but actually arose due to the political ideological character of the statutes, intended to exclude or rather make it impossible to coexist in the same organization, those forces perhaps seeking unity in good faith, but which did not conceive of or want the party as a concrete and irreplaceable instrument for the class and its revolutionary leadership. Given that all this happened in the historical climate of the Second International where parliamentary democratic guidelines dominated, the commitment to legal struggle is not surprising. The strange thing is that we are still not clear that, as the experience of Lenin in the old Iskra shows, the solution to the party's organizational thesis involving or involves having a political intuition deep enough to realize that the development of the revolution occurred in the context of an objectively conservative reality. The clash between the militant activity of Lenin and Plekhanov, Martov, and Axelrod, who were seeking a purely formal party unity, circles, according to them, had historical greatness and had to continue to enjoy a permanent and active presence within the party, was because they expected that this delimitation of the party would act like a centrifugal force on the circles. Indeed, in the October Revolution, these forces would be on the other side of the class barricade, the experience we want through the experience we went through in Italy is no less full of lessons in the phase prior to the formation of the party. At both the Imola meeting and the Congress of Livorno, overcoming the groups that could be defined generally as of the left provoked quite harsh and controversial internal disagreements. But the fact is that the agreement around unity developed with an ease inversely proportional to its sincerity. It is true that what most contributed to make this possible was the attractiveness of the October Revolution, but one must take into account that, in Imola, no group played nor could play the role Iskra played in the Second Congress. Neither ordinovists nor abstainers, 
nor pro-communist maximalists even ever claimed that their program and their tendency had to become the program and tendency of the party of Livorno. That is how far the domination of the politics of the center of the international extended. What was missing in 1921 was a platform to serve as an effective central role, as did Iskra in the years 1890 to 1900. The comic, yet at the same time sad moment at the Congress came when the representative of the abstentionists solemnly declared the fraction dissolved and retracted its main demand, abstentionism, to allay the suspicions and ill-concealed anger of the maximalist representatives, expressed with eloquence by Luigi Salvatore during the proceedings. Another of the comic and pitiful moments at Imola was the sacrifice of ordinavism on the altar of the party that was about to be born. All this happened in a situation in which the real possibilities for revolution were increasing, but what would happen later when the reflex of the revolutionary wave led it to break on the wall of counter-revolution? What would happen was what actually happened in 1924 when Gramsci and Togliotti grew their old horns back, namely the original vices of, of immediatism and idealism upon which the experience of Lord Dean Nuovo in turn was based. These were blunt weapons, but according to them, they were the most suitable for expressing the ideas and methods of the workers' struggle. They were the best suited to their changing conditions when a policy of, com of compromises and contingent commitments substituted the perspective of uninterrupted revolution and the catastrophic outcome of the class conflict, when, in short, it was time to be legalistic in and in favor of the Republican Constitution, and all because with the apparent and transitory consolidation of capitalism, it seemed that democracy was untouchable, i.e. not deteriorating over time, nor was it subject to the changing and conflicting vicissitudes of capital. In light of this double experience, we can now proceed to examine the current situation in which the dispersion of the groups of the communist left is usually due to cause causes profoundly different to those we have discussed above, although the problem in the background is always the same, namely the rebuilding of a party capable of facing the demands of the revolutionary struggle. But let's look at the true nature of these groups, paying more attention to their ideological political features rather than their, rather than their numbers. It is disconcerting to note that all claim that we need a party and all claim to be the party in embryo. In this sense, we can say that in the present situation in terms of the stature of men, their political foresight and sense of responsibility, the revolutionary minority is well below the experience of the old Iskra and even the, old, the Imola meeting. If we cannot establish a criterion that differentiates the communist left groups, then it would be impossible to justify in politically myo myopic not to consider objective factors which confer historical legitimacy on the theoretical elaboration of a sustained and consistent opposition to any policy of compromise and capitulation, as well as the building of an, of an organizational base of selected cadres. We are part of the history of the workers' movement under the name of Communist Left. The entire Internationalist Communist Party was born within this movement, having been the left opposition in the Socialist Party up until the Livorno Congress, the majority in the Communist Party of Italy until the Bolshevization of the party after which it became it become the opposition until the outbreak of the Second World War. It organized itself as a fraction in France and Belgium in 1928 in constant touch with the internal center, which in 1945 resolved to organize itself as a party, following a class line which had never deviated nor broken through all these years, despite the twin attacks of the traditional class enemy and the new reactionary forces of Stalinism. And it is here in a position where it has not always been easy to work, but which nevertheless is always fertile, where one has to look for the ideas, motives, energies, and experiences, experiences of new people to get down to work resolutely on the enormous task of rebuilding the revolutionary party with the prestige and moral, moral and political authority this involves. Besides the communist internationalists who are responsible for this task, not through natural or divine right or birthright, nor because they are deemed primus inter paris, there are other groups that have recently emerged from the crisis within the PCI whose good faith or ability is not in question, 
But this is not enough to be a militant revolutionary if one does not also prove capable of facing and successfully carrying out critical re-examination of one's political views in regard to the great, po great problems such as the class nature of the Soviet state and the nature of its economic and political organization. The nature of war in general, and in particular colonial wars, in the historic imperialist phase of financial capital. Finally, you have to decide whether to accept the revolutionary strategy, which means that in Russia, in China, and in democratic countries directly or indirectly allied to these centers of power, the full extent of the problem of the conquest of power is raised. We have to destroy the structures of the capitalist commodity economy upon which the rising power of state capitalism is being erected. The rise of these fractions can be attributed almost exclusively to the process of decomposition of the first worker state, which has spawned a new opportunism, which considers state capitalism in Russia as a phase required in the construction of socialism, or rather as a necessary stage of the lower stage of socialism. Those who do not take this into account will not understand what is common to the experience of Lenin's old Iskra, which unfolded in the historic setting of the Second International, and the current situation in which the historical problem of the Revolutionary Party is similarly up against huge barriers, sometimes insurmountable on a proletarian terrain, largely shaped by Stalinism, which nurtures those bad mushrooms who call themselves Trotskyists, Bordigists, or Maoists. They all claim to embody the ideology of the revolution, but actually diminish the political heritage of the entire proletariat to their own intellectual level, their own vanity, if not their own personal gain. Therefore, these differences that separate the groups of the historical minority that claim to be internationalist are not insignificant from those who tend to, to merge into a single organization and who generally originate from the chronic crisis of the PCI, although they declare themselves communist internationalists. The former recognized the need for a class break with PCI ideology and politics which have raged and still rage in our country, while the latter, the Trotskyists, Maoists, pro-Chinese activists, must demonstrate with their theoretical contribution and political activity that they have broken all ties with opportunism. And really, in our analysis, we are most interested in the former, the groups of the historical minority.